It's good to be with you again today. I'm your host, Akin Ayeni, born again Christian, family physician, a servant of the Most High God. Today we're going to uh, delve into a topic that uh, has been in Christendom for quite a long time, but that I believe a lot of Christians really, really do not understand very well, and it's become a religious lingo. I'm going to be talking about the grace of God, the grace of God. And I'm going to start by looking at the first time the word grace was used. Anytime you want to study a word in the Bible, I will advise you to look at the first time it was used. I've practiced that for a long time. My teachers taught me that method. It's called the law of first mention. And what I've noticed about that is when you do that, you will see that God does not make mistake when he uses a word for the first time. I did it with the word worship. When Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, it was an, it was an awesome revelation to me. So I decided to do the same thing with the word grace. And I could not believe what God revealed to me by me yielding to that method that my teachers had taught me. The word grace was not used for us in the New Testament. It was not used for us by Jesus. It was not used for us by Paul, even though Paul used it much more than anybody else. The word grace was first used in the Old Testament, and it was used concerning the man Noah. So let's travel down the, into the Old Testament and look at the story of Noah and how the word grace was first used. In Genesis chapter 6, starting from verse 1, um, I'm going to read this long passage and then I'm going to wind back to this birth of Noah. He said, when men began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with man forever for he is mortal. His days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards, when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. Verse 5. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Note the emphasis. Every inclination of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth. Men and animals and creatures that move, al move along the ground and birds, and birds of the air. For I am grieved that I have made them. Now, listen now. God is saying I'm going to destroy the species of men. I mean, I can remember in the days of my zoology and biology, you have what we call genu. I can't remember those terms very well. But you have, when you say, a species of being. I'm going to destroy them. That means 
everyone. No exception. That's what I feel that this, this is saying right here. But then, in verse 8, I, re I read this. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, I'm not going to read the whole story from then on. Uh, Bible scholars, and even those who don't study the Bible very well, but who know about the flood, now can understand the rest of the story. Noah was saved from the flood that destroyed the whole earth except his family and eight of them that were in the ark. That's the story of the flood. Now, let us imagine what we are talking about very well. Let us fast wind to our generation, to this contemporary world. Let us think about disasters that have happened around us. There has been no disaster in the history of mankind that has been worse than Noah's flood. This man, eight of them, his family members, were saved from a disaster that ruined the whole world. Worse than any tsunami we've ever had, worse than any earthquake we've ever had, worse than any tornado we've ever had. Worse than any monsoon wind that has, ever, that has ever killed people. And if you've seen some of those, you can go and Google them. These were very bad situations. But God is now saying in his book that one man found favor with him. And he saved him from the disaster that killed the whole world. Except him and his family. So I said to myself, what was it about this man that made him find grace with the Lord? Was he the best? And did he have the, if, we, if, he was going to, if he was living in that generation, will he be the a mega pastor, a mega church pastor who has the largest congregation? Would that be, would that, would that be Noah? Or will he be like Mother Teresa who Gave everything for the poor. What was it about Noah? What merited him having this favor? That's the million dollar question. Is no, was Noah the holiest that ever lived on the earth at that time? Was, it, was that what made him have this favor? Have we ever thought about that? Was it like Mother Teresa, or was it like a mega preacher, like Rick Warren, or T.D. Jakes, if I can mention name? What was it about Noah that made him find grace in the eyes of the Lord? When the whole earth was being destroyed. Please think about this. So I thought about it. Then I went back to see what happened before the destruction. Now, in Genesis chapter 5, verse 28, they said, when Lamech, that's father, Noah's father, when Lamech had lived 182 years, he had a son. He named him Noah and said, he will comfort us in the labor and painful toils of our hands Cursed by the ground the Lord has cursed. That was the way they named this guy. It was a prophetic name. They prophetically named him and said, All this toil that has been going on since the earth was caused when Adam fell, perhaps this will be the last generation that will have to go through this painful toil, labor, that we are going through. Thorns and thistles, that is the end, the ground is producing for us. And they named their son that. 
And I said, well, what was it? What again did Noah do? I can't see anything else apart from his name. I can't see anything else. And before him, only two other people were named to have walked with God, were named to have done anything with God after the fall of, of, of Adam. The first one was Abel that gave the best sacrifice that was accepted when his brother's sacrifice was rejected, and he was killed, so there was no genealogy. Then Enoch, who was actually now, by genealogy, the great-grandfather of Noah, they said he walked with God, and that was it. Methuselah, who was his grandfather, all we knew about him was, was a, he lived longest among all men, but nothing else was said about him. Then his father, Lamech, all we can say was that he worked hard. He was a hard worker, and he just thought this was too much. There's got to be, it's got to be better than this. So he named his son that way, that there has to be something better than this. There has to be a place of rest somewhere. But if you went back to Genesis, God himself that made man in his own image and likeness rested on the seventh day. So he named his son rest, comfort. And so his son received that into his heart. And his son now said, there's something wrong with this picture. Something is wrong with this picture. Not only that, he looked around him. He looked at the way everybody didn't care. Everybody was just doing whatever they want to do. The, the Bible says, said the inclination, the thoughts and inclination of every man was not towards God. They were doing their own thing. So it was really an issue of not really caring about God's existence. Now, some people will think that maybe everyone in Noah's time were wicked in the way we know wickedness. The way we think wickedness is, is someone that killed somebody, someone that stole from somebody. And when we talk about wicked people, we think that way. We use the, definition, the, Bibli uh, the, the dictionary definition of wickedness. But the biblical definition of wickedness is not the, is the, the dictionary definition of wickedness. The Bible says, let the wicked man forsake his ways, and the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. So the biblical definition of wickedness is anyone that sticks to his ways and forsakes God's ways. That's the biblical definition of wickedness. And so, the biblical definition of righteousness, on the other hand, is someone who has purposed in his heart to look out for God's way of doing things. And the Bible says, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. I guarantee you that Noah began to preach righteousness right relationship with God, believing that there's something better than this, long before he began to build the ark, long before the flood came. He knew something was wrong with the picture around him. He knew that there was something that about the way people were living that was making him uncomfortable. And that fear of God was what made him begin to seek God by faith. There was nothing else. There was no character attributes that the Bible showed us about Noah that made him merited God's grace.